Cormac Smith has worked in public relations and corporate communications for over three decades. Before moving into the government sector in 2000, he spent most of the 1990s managing media relations in the pharmaceutical industry. But he has also held several senior communication management positions in government and Whitehall departments. Crucially for the topics we're going to be talking about today, in 2016, he traveled to Ukraine to take up a special appointment as the strategic communication advisor to Pavlo Klimkin, then the foreign minister of Ukraine. He was attached to the British embassy in Kiev, but was embedded in Ukraine's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the first foreigner to hold such a position. While in Kiev, he also advised and provided training for five other government ministries and worked directly with three other cabinet ministers, health, education and the deputy prime minister. In addition, he worked with the National Security and Defence Council of Ukraine and the NATO mission to the country. Welcome to Silicon Curtain Podcast. Please like, subscribe and definitely add a comment. Also, we're going to be talking today about Ukrainian resilience. So please do check out the listings of Ukrainian charities that appear in the description of the video. It's incredibly important that we assist Ukrainians to remain resilient in the face of Russian aggression. After you've done that, please also do consider buying me a coffee or become a patron. We are going to be making available a lot more material on the channel for patron members and those who are members uh, of, of the channel uh, on YouTube and so on. We're going to be putting a lot more transcriptions of the best of Russian language journalism to make this information accessible to an English speaking audience. Cormac, I'm delighted to welcome you to the channel. Jonathan, it's a great pleasure to join you. Thank you very much. Well, before we hit record, we were talking about a whole range of things, but let's start with the shift in the West. Have we come so far in two and a half years? We started with as long as it takes, then we had as long as we can. We seem to sort of inch towards the concept of maybe Ukrainian victory is something we want to align with. I suspect that we're now shifting back. We've just had the extraordinary statement that's come out of the US that Ukraine is not ready, quote, too corrupt to be able to join NATO at this time. Are we moving back to a far weaker set of potential outcomes from the war? The problem has been incrementalism from the very, very start. And the problem has been the failure to simply say our objective is that Ukraine should win. I don't believe any major Western leader has yet said that. And indeed, there seems to be a fear of defeating Russia. And that's a fear that I have that's a fear that I have um sensed from the very beginning. You know, I come to this I come to speak to you today with cold fury really on behalf of my Ukrainian friends that this horrendous slap in the face that they have received from the State Department, which I think has Jake Sullivan's fingerprints all over it, that Ukraine is simply too corrupt to join NATO. You know, Ukraine has been on a, and yes, Ukraine certainly was a country with a massive corruption problem. But since the revolution of dignity, Euromaidan in 2013, 2014, Ukraine has been making huge progress and i know because the um the position that i held it was made very very clear that my position was was first and foremost was to communicate and to help drive the reform agenda and the anti corruption agenda and indeed you know when i was out there as you said in your introduction i ended up doing work with several other ministries and of course Although I was managed with a very, very light touch by Her Majesty's ambassador while I was there and I was embedded with the Ukrainians, um, if I was doing anything off piste, like going to work with the Ministry of Defense or the Ministry of Education and Science, I would obviously check in with my boss ultimately and I would explain what I'd been asked to do. And it was always it was always the same challenge. Could I demonstrate very, very clearly that what I was doing was something which would aid, drive, and communicate the reform agenda. So, you know, I've seen this up very, very closely. And, you know, since this horrible, horrible war 
or further invasion happened, um, we could excuse Ukraine for battening the hatches down and saying, you know what, maybe corruption is something we can deal with. We, you know, we need to survive first. But Ukraine has very, very visibly um, increased its work and continued its work against corruption. And, you know, don't take my word for it. Last year, the European Union declared when they effectively permitted Ukraine into the formal accession process for membership of the European Union, that it was on the basis of the progress that Ukraine had made and was continuing to make with dealing with corruption. So I'm inclined to say um, there's, you know, I read the article in The Telegraph. I did an interview on this earlier on. Um, they are very, very short on detail as to what they actually expect the Ukrainians to do. But it seems to me like a like an excuse and a very, very weak excuse. And I, as I have no problem saying, this has the fingerprints of Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor to the Biden administration, all over it. This is the same administration that forbids Ukraine to use weapons to strike military targets within Russia from where on a daily basis murderous attacks are being launched on cities across Ukraine which are daily murdering Ukrainian citizens. This makes no sense. Um, the only conclusion one can be left with is that people in power um, are afraid to defeat Russia. Well, we'll come on to coercive manipulation in a minute, because I think that plays a role here, certainly. Um, but let's let's continue on this theme of victory and corruption. Corruption is the thing that always gets the headlines. It's always the, the mud that is uh, you know slung around by various parties. And of course, it's a classic Kremlin propaganda line. But if you analyze the Russian system, um, it seems to me that informal relations, nepotism, are in some ways far more dangerous than out and out corruption. It's the uh, hierarchical system which stifles any kind of dissent or originality um, and which rewards toadyism, rewards those who are prepared to toe the line in a fairly vicious hierarchical structure. Well, it seems to me that this is what Ukraine is fighting. It's not just corruption. It's the entire, entire set of relations that govern the Russian uh, vertical as opposed to the Ukrainian horizontal. Do people in power, do people making decisions not really understand actually the extent to which Ukraine is rooting out or de-Russifying itself? One, I think far too few people in power really do understand Ukraine. You know, I started saying towards the end of 2016, beginning of 2017, that in the West, we need to see the world through Ukrainian eyes in particular, we need to see Russia through Ukrainian eyes. And also I added the eyes of other nations in the Eastern neighborhood, the Baltics and Poland, and the countries that grew up either as either as captives of the Soviet Union, as was Ukraine and as were the Baltics, or as um, countries like Poland and um, Czechoslovakia, which um, uh, um, you know, which lay behind the Iron Curtain, and we're very much, um, we're very much under the influence of um, Russia. You know, when I um, when I worked with when I worked with um, people in Russia I, or in Ukraine, I'm sorry, when I worked with people in Ukraine at government level, I used to always open up by saying Ukraine fights a war on two fronts, because of course, remember, this war has been going on since 2014. And I used to open up by saying Ukraine fights a war on two fronts. It fights a war against Russia, but it also fights a war against um, those people within Ukraine who would rape and pillage and plunder their own country. And, you know, to a very large extent, these were these were still Kremlin um, and sympathetic oligarchs. One of the things about this war is it may well have been the final death knell of the oligarch class within Ukraine. And, you know, if Ukraine can survive this war, and that's very much down to us 
I fear. Um, I think, you know, history will tell us that that this war has been one of the great um, accelerators for Ukraine dealing with dealing with corruption, as I've already said, in the teeth of this genocidal war, when we might forgive Ukraine for dropping a few balls, they have continued to fight corruption and they have been judged successful in fighting corruption and continuing to do it by the European Union less than a year ago. Um, I know whose word I want to take, um, the American State Department of the European Union. I'm a European Union. I'll take the word of the European Union every day. And let's dig into escalation management, because there are various arguments that could be made that that actually there is deep uh, fear within Western policymakers of Russia's potential use of tactical nuclear weapons, uh, Russia's potential disintegration and the sort of chaos uh, and bloodletting that that would unleash. Um, allowing China to become the sort of uh, de facto, uh, let's say, controller of Russia, if not even annexing, uh, annexing parts of Russian territory that previously stolen from China. There are all sorts of scenarios, I think, that play out within policymakers' heads. Is it possible that with escalation management and all the other kind of incrementalism that you mentioned, what we're actually seeing are key capitals such as Berlin and Washington closely calibrating their supply of weapons and support to Ukraine, as well as putting in red lines with a view not to Ukraine winning, but to preventing really Russia from advancing, but also preventing from Russia from collapsing? Jonathan, you just used the term escalation management. I'll use a different term, appeasement. And, you know, it was that Great Britain, apocryphal or not, but let's say he did say at Winston Churchill, who said, the appeaser is one who feeds crocodiles, hoping that he will be eaten last. And we know this. And I go back, if I can quote, if I can quote somebody, um, former um, retired General Wesley Clark, five-star U.S. general, former um, Supreme Commander of NATO. And Wesley Clark said, over two years ago now, it was a security conference in Kiev. I think it was June of 2022. Wesley Clark, in a, you know, in a long panel discussion, but he said three things. He said, give Ukraine every weapon they need. And he said, I remember at the time, including F-16s and A-10s, the A-10 being the famous ground attack aircraft, the Warthog. He said, give Russia no sanctuary behind her own borders. This speaks directly to the the ludicrousness of the fact that Ukraine cannot use American weapons to strike at Russian air bases from where murderous attacks have been launched. And the third thing he said is, is do not be intimidated by Putin's nuclear threats. I don't know if anybody has kept count, but I heard recently that the nuclear saber had been rattled by Putin probably over 100 times. We remember two days before the full-scale invasion that Russia was putting its nuclear um, 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 forces on full alert. That was a signal to the West. And it seems that each time, each time that um, Russia does this, it seems there are there are people in high places um, who cower down and who are cowed by this. Despite the fact, you know, before my education on the Eastern neighborhood ever began, which probably didn't really begin till 2014. I've been a, you know, I studied politics and, and, and the Cold War at university nearly 40 years ago. I've been a student of history all my life. But my real education started in 2014 when I began to be invited to former communist countries as a British as a senior British government person to speak about and work with them on the structure of good government communications and that was where I really started to learn and in all I've been to about 13 different countries both former Soviet socialist republics for them and former countries from behind the Iron Curtain and also um, countries of the former Yugoslavia where there was a different form of communism under Tito as you know, and I, that's where my education really began. And my education about what, what good people in all these countries were, 
working very, very hard to do, not just fighting externally, but fighting the fighting the corruption and the people within the oligarchs within their countries who would rape, plunder and pillage their countries from within. And, you know, I often reflect on what Wesley Clark said, but I reflect on what one other man said, Oleksiy Reznikov, um, who was at the time, he was the last Minister of Defence of Ukraine. And he went on CNN a few days before Christmas 2021, again, two months before the full-scale invasion. And he said very, very clearly, he said, we do not expect or want your boots on the ground. Just give us the weapons we need and we will do our own fighting. You know, Wesley Clark, the Ukrainians were crying out for air cover. Wesley Clark talked about F-16s over two years ago. Ukraine still has not got F-16s. We find out that the first 24 F-16s are just about to be delivered to Ukraine almost, almost two and a half years into this horrible war. And not from America, but from the Netherlands. Um, you know, the, the the Germans still hold back on on Taurus. I spoke to um, a very good friend, a senior Ukrainian diplomat, a year and a half ago about the issue of tanks. And I said, how many do you need? This was when the Germans were holding back on the export license for the Leopard 2, which was the tank that they really needed. It was it was most I'm not a military man, but I was I've been reliably told it was the tank that was most suitable for their purposes. And of course, although there were many outside Germany, the Germans held the export license, as indeed the Americans hold the export license on the F-16. And my friend said to me, very, very senior diplomat, he said, he said 300 could do the job, he said, but we probably, he said 500 would be nice. Now, the last count I got very recently, they still hadn't got 100 modern battle tanks. Britain has done a great thing. Britain, It was Britain that, remember, that unblocked the logjam with giving them, I think it was 14 challengers, followed by America, you know, agreed to give 31 Abrams. Oh, but they wouldn't get them for another year and a half. You know, and that finally led to the to the Germans sign, signing off. So at every single at every single turn, we have been we seem to have been afraid to give the Ukrainians what they need. They had a much vaunted counteroffensive last year, which in retrospect could not have succeeded, because we were expecting the Ukrainians to carry out a counteroffensive under circumstances that no. NATO country would even consider. Remember in 1944, um, 80 years ago, was it? Um, the big counteroffensive of D-Day. And the Allies had overwhelming air superiority. And they still lost tens of thousands on the first day. And there was still a year of bitter, bloody fighting to follow that before the war was brought to a conclusion. And we expected... You know, I was speaking to a military friend of mine recently. Um, the the defences that the Russians had had time to to build that the Ukrainians were faced with were some of the were some of the deepest and the toughest in the history of warfare. You know, the depth of the minefields and so forth. And they simply they simply didn't have the technology to deal with that. They neither had they neither had the armor in sufficient quantity, nor did they have the air cover. Um, to use the combined, what the military men talk about, combined arms operations of military, of armor, of air support combined, which is what which is what NATO would accept. And, and on top of that, going against such deep defenses, we expected the Ukrainians to prosecute a counteroffensive with, at very best, one hand tied behind there tied behind their tied behind their back and we now realize of course when we examine the red lines that seem to be sort of softening up a little bit you know ukraine is allowed to hit russian territory with u.s made weapons but only within a small strip of 100 kilometers that doesn't include any of the significant air bases but at least it allows them to hit troops that may be massing for further incursions if we park the idea of Ukrainian victory and just say, OK, behind the scenes, the Allies are committed to Ukraine not losing. Is it not true that we haven't even really been supplying them with equipment to do that? Um, 
if we look at the F-16s, there's lots of arguments about training, logistics, et cetera, which you can see will delay that and, you know, certainly give sort of bureaucrats or people excuses not to do it. But Ukrainians have mastered the Bradleys. They've done extraordinary things with these fighting vehicles and shown they're highly adept at utilizing them in the context of this battlefield and even doing things which the manufacturers and the tacticians that envisaged those vehicles didn't even have in mind. So there's lessons to learn there. There are, at this point, hundreds and hundreds of Bradleys uh, sitting in the US desert, many which are potentially operational, many others which could be cannibalized for spare parts. Even if we just wanted Ukraine to hold the line, we could and should be doing an awful lot more than has been done. I agree. And, you know, I have I have said before that we have let Ukraine down badly. I go back to Alexei Reznikov saying, just give us the weapons we need. We'll do our own fighting. My God, how the Ukrainians have shown us they can fight and how adaptable and how quick they learn. You know, you mentioned their use of the Bradley and using a Bradley fighting vehicle to take out the, the Russians' supposedly invincible T-90 tank. I'm not sure if you saw a film which is in circulation of that. And indeed, I was speaking to a... Um, I was speaking to a military friend of mine, Philip Ingram, who I think you know about that and how it actually works. But it's they have proven to be incredibly brave, incredibly well led and disciplined, and you know, um, just incredibly creative and inventive. And they have made the best use. You know, we also heard when they first supplied um, uh, the, the uh, Patriot air defense systems. Um, the Western trainers were absolutely amazed at how quick the Ukrainians mastered the use of these very, very complex systems. So, you know, I have said before, had we given the Ukrainians the weapons they needed, they asked for, and they told us very clearly what they wanted, if we'd given them those in the first months of this war, this war could already be over, I would wager, and it could be over in Ukraine's favour. But could I say... Could I say one more thing? I was making a few notes before I came on, and I was thinking, and I um, something that a something that a friend of mine. I'm 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 going to mix my metaphors a little bit, so um, excuse me. A very good Ukrainian friend of mine said to me several years ago. He said the problem is Ukraine has always been a corridor and never a room. You know, you meet and. Um, and I put that together with something else I heard recently, a chessboard. And this is what really makes me very, very angry, because I've been to Ukraine and I have Ukrainian friends and I speak to them every day. And what we do effectively is we deny agency to the Ukrainian people. This is a this is a this is a nation of over 40 million people. It's a functioning democracy. They have decided what they want to do. You know, it is not up to Russia or any other country. It is up to Ukraine to decide how they how they organize their economic affairs and how they organize their defensive affairs. Yet there seems to be a prevailing attitude that we see Ukraine, we see Ukraine as a chessboard. It's a chessboard between East and West, and the Ukrainians are mere pawns on that chessboard. And the same people, the same people that do this, I'll stay close to home. And, you know, Britain, as the Irishman says, who's lived here for 37 years, but Britain has been among Ukraine's very, very best friends. Don't take my word for it. Ask senior diplomats and senior military men who I speak to and have been speaking to since, 19, since 2016 who their best friend is. And especially since I left the government and said, look, I'm not a I'm not a British diplomat or civil servant anymore. You can tell me what you really think. Do you still rate the Brits? Yes, Cormac, we still rate the Brits. But, you know, I'll talk closer to home. If you could imagine here, you know, I'm sitting in my comfortable, safe London home. I think you're up in Oxford. Could you imagine if just let's just let's just suspend our disbelief for a moment. You can imagine if France had invaded and taken over Kent, Sussex, um, Cornwall, um, other counties in the south where murdering 
We're wiping cities off the face of the earth. We're murdering, raping, torturing, enslaving, deporting children. And from France, they were they were bombing London and Birmingham and Manchester and Leeds and our other cities, and they were murdering British citizens every day. And America was maybe giving us weapons, but they were saying, no, you can't use your weapons to strike the, um, the air bases in France. I mean, would we accept being treated like that? Yet we seem to accept that we can treat the Ukrainians like this, that we can deny the Ukrainians agency and that we can treat this as a chessboard and Ukrainians as mere pawns. You know, we are supposed to have moved beyond that. We're supposed to have moved beyond spheres of influence. We talk about a rules-based order. And, you know, if there is a rules-based order is not perfect. It has pertained since 1945. And although it's imperfect, it has given us the greatest period of peace, prosperity and security the world has ever known. And in democracies, we should be able to learn from our mistakes. And they've been, you know, our leaders have made many mistakes over the last 80 years, 79 years. But we should be able to learn from those because we're not we're not tyrannies. We're not um, we're not we're not ruled by despots. And um, so. You know, the one if there's one if there's one rule above all else, and I've argued with people that told me there's no such thing as a rules based order. Again, they've you know, they've 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 trotted out the Kremlin line. But there is a rules based order, and if there's one rule above all else that defines that rules based order, it is that might does not make right. We are supposed to have gone past the point in our history of civilized people where a where a larger more aggressive neighbor can simply roll into a neighbor and murder rape pillage destroy cities enslave people this is exactly what russia is doing today it's genocidal what russia does in ukraine passes all five tests of the united nations convention on genocide you know have no doubt about it why do why do more people not talk about genocide? Because we'd have to do something about it. It would be it would be an inconvenient truth. But I ask, you know, certainly any um, any any you know Brits who are listening to this, just think about what I said. Imagine, imagine Kent and Sussex and 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 Cornwall and 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 other and other and other counties in the south of England been taken over maybe 20 percent up to 20 percent of between 15 and 20 percent of the area of england or the united kingdom if you prefer and if the sort of atrocities were being carried out on a daily basis how would we feel and how would we feel about other powers treating us as pawns exactly put in the british context what if uh what if Scotland moved south and burnt Berwick upon Tweed, etc.? And in fact, these things did go on in, in history. And Russian trolls love to point out that actually, who are you to speak? You know, the British had an empire, did things like this. History is replete with these actions. I think my point is that history is, but we don't have to be governed by that behavior now. And indeed, we haven't been since the post-World War II order was established how far do you think russia is trying to take us back to that world of the law of the jungle where a pure hierarchy of power determines everything every kind of interaction every kind of relation um what what's the risk of russia being able to corrupt attack and dissolve these things that we would call uh, the the international rules based order or a a rules based society. Absolutely, one hundred percent. You know, we have the um, we have the great myths of why um, Russia invaded Ukraine. I always say there's five of them. There's more, but there's five great myths. And the first one we might as well start. It was because of NATO expansion. And, you know, um, that Russia was promised NATO would never expand. No, they weren't. That is a lie. Never happened. There is no there is no treaty. There is no document. The second, of course, is that Ukraine is full of Nazis. 
No, it's not. There's a Ukraine actually has a far, far less of a problem with the far right than most countries in Europe, including the United States and probably including Britain. In their last election in 2019, 73% of the population voted for a Jew of Russian origin to be president. Most Western leaders could only dream of that sort of a of that sort of a mandate. While on the other side of the scale, the far right club the various far right groups clubbed together so they could maximize their vote, and they achieved two point zero four percent of the popular vote and no seats in the Rada, the Ukrainian parliament. So Ukraine is full of Nazis. No, it's not. Donbass was a civil war. Donbass was not a civil war. You know, this was again. Donbass was a was a conflict that was um, that was that was stirred up by Russia. And when Lavrov was, when I was in Ukraine, when Lavrov was denying that Russia was even in eastern Ukraine, we knew from independent observers that at any time there was six to seven thousand regular Russian troops in command and control positions. There was anywhere between thirty-five and forty thousand. Russian paid mercenaries. There was up to 500 Russian battle tanks. The British army only has about 140 battle tanks operational. You know, and there was just, um, the list went on and on and on in terms of artillery and equipment and so far and so forth. Of course, there was the great myth that Maidan, Euromaidan, was a, um, was a US-backed coup. No, it wasn't. It was probably, you know, it was a great popular uprising where a million to a million and a half people spontaneously came onto the streets of Kyiv because a corrupt pro-Kremlin president, Yanukovych, had unilaterally decided at a, in Vilnius that instead of signing an association agreement with the EU, which was the will of the Ukrainian people, and it was the basis on which he had, part of the basis on which he had been voted in in 2010, he decided not to sign it and to sign a alternative um, agreement, bringing dragging Ukraine back into the Russian orbit. As a good friend said to me one night, now a very senior Ukrainian diplomat, we were sitting in the office and he said, man, what you've got to remember, it's not just what we want. It's not that we want the, the wealth of the European Union. It's what we want to get away from. You know, and this was the chap who told me that he watched his parents in their mid-70s, including his father, who had been a colonel in the Soviet army and fought in Afghanistan. And he said when he watched his parents standing on the Maidan in temperatures of, I don't know, minus 20, and not taking a step back as people were beaten and shot right and left of them, he looked me in the eyes and he said, that made me think about my country. And there's things, there's... It's moments like that in my two years in Ukraine that I'll never forget. And these are these are people that stay in my life that I speak to, or if I don't speak to them, we we message and we text because they're in various cities and they're they're probably working, I don't know about you, they're working harder than I'll ever understand. And sacrificing even 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 the diplomats, not all warriors carry guns. You know, Ukraine's diplomats fight just as much for their country. And it's a lonely, hard fight. You've had these extensive uh, conversations with the Ukrainians and you continue to do so. And I'm sure you hear the same things that Ukrainians tell me, which is that Russia is exercising, let's let's call it evil. They're committing evil acts, atrocious acts on the territory of Ukraine. <coughs> they still have ambition to take the entire country. That hasn't gone away. And Ukrainians will say that if you do not stop Russia, it will no stop. There is there is no mechanism there. There is no moral framework that will cause Russia to cease these kind of actions. Ukrainians understand this well. Escalation management has created an enabling space for Russia to explore and project this toxicity. My fear is that we certainly have not reached the bottom there is a long, long way for them still to go. Um, and I know you you want to tackle this in a, in, a, in a certain way, but I'll just throw this out there. We've given them the space to become 
the absolute anti-democracy, this anti-rules-based society, and they are exploring the full extent of that from sponsoring proxies, terrorists in Europe, from starting to play with sabotage, using criminal networks. They are potentially going to be using battalions of engineers and instructors from North Korea who will be fighting on the territory of Europe. We've given them the space to go to a place which a few years ago would have been unimaginable. Uh, how, how do we stop this enablement before it escalates to a point where, you know, essentially we'll be in World War Three? is my view. Look, Jonathan, we've already spoken about the great lies that Russia has um, put around and, have, and has unfortunately effectively got into our political conversations, the great lies as to why they invaded Ukraine from NATO expansion to US-backed coups to Ukraine being full of Nazis. Let's look at the reasons that, Ukraine, that Russia did invade Ukraine. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is an old-fashioned colonial conquest something that should have died out in the 19th century. And, you know, there are two reasons for this. And the main reason is that during Soviet times, Ukraine was the jewel in the crown. Ukraine, I'm reliably told, accounted for as much as 40% of GDP and industrial output of the old Soviet Union, even though Ukraine was only one of 15 socialist Soviet republics. Right. We have We have already talked about the disinformation and the myths which Russia put about to justify going in from NATO expansion to Ukraine being full of Nazis to, you know, Donbass being a civil war and various others. They're very easy to debunk. Um, let's look at the real reason that Russia invaded Ukraine. This was an old-fashioned 19th century war of colonial conquest. And there were two reasons for that. Putin is on record of saying that the breakup of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century. Ukraine was the jewel in the crown of the Soviet Union. Although it was just one of 15 Soviet socialist republics, it accounted for maybe 40% of GDP and of industrial output of the old Soviet Union. Not only that, it was the breadbasket. Ukraine is where all of the the brains trust where all of the rocket scientists were in Ukraine, all of the all of the technological, and we're seeing now the great wealth of technological ability that Ukraine has. So there was that reason. Ukraine was simply, simply something that Putin wanted back. But the second reason that Putin invaded Ukraine, you know, I've been saying this since a month before the invasion, every time I've been dealing in interviews with the disinformation. The second reason that Putin went into Ukraine was because of the threat of a, of a successful free democracy on his doorstep. Remember, there was a, there was a nascent democratic uh, movement in Russia in 2010, 2011, 2013, which seems to have largely died out. This was, this was the greatest threat that Putin simply could not face. And, you know, when you're, you're not dealing with an ordinary government, you're dealing with the Kremlin. In the Kremlin, you have, a, you have a kleptocratic regime based on mafia and KGB principles. Simply that. You have a small number of people enriching themselves at the expense of over 145 million of their own countrymen and keeping them, and keeping them down. So that's why, that's why Ukraine was really invaded. And we need to start by more of our leaders and indeed our public in democracies understanding, understanding that. Um, and until we understand that, but, you know, going further from that, Ukraine is probably the most important place on earth right now. Because there's two reasons that we need to support Ukraine and we need to support Ukraine much more than we are doing. One, there's a moral reason, and I'm guessing, Jonathan, that that moral reason is sufficient for you and I, which is why both of us spend so much of our time devoted to this and to trying to communicate around it and trying to win, trying to win over hearts and minds. But there are 
especially in these straitened times, there are many for which the moral reason is simply not enough. People are worried about the cost of living. They're worried about their mortgage. They're worried about whatever. And there's a lot of good people that just can't see it. But they have got to understand that this is a wolf that will come to our door. Because fundamentally, what's at stake is something called the rules-based international order. And if I can say for a moment, I studied politics and economics in the mid-1980s at university. I've been a student of history all my life. But until I went to Ukraine in 2016, I had never really come across or noticed the term rules-based order or rules-based international order. Why is this? Because, Jonathan, men like you and I, people of our age, have grown up in, in comfort and freedom and safety. And we have taken the freedoms which we have had since 1945 for granted. And, you know, in Russia, we have a country that hates our rules-based order. I always go back to 2017 and Sergei Lavrov at the Munich Security Conference when Lavrov made a speech where he almost celebrated the coming asunder of the old order, which was our rules-based order. And he talked about the rise of the post-West era. Now, our rules-based order may be imperfect. And our leaders over the last 80 years may have made many mistakes. That is that is undoubtable. But we are democracies and we are capable. We are capable with the will of good people of learning from our mistakes and improving it. I put it, I put it to you, Jonathan, and I put it to anybody listening into this podcast. You can continue to live in the freedom and relative wealth that we have all enjoyed. Or you can, you can transition to a world which is a post-West era. And that post-West era would be dominated by Russia, likely as a junior partner to China, because China has been playing a long game. And China, we are seeing, is moving closer and closer in. British security services recently told us that they had good evidence to believe that China is now supplying lethal support to Russia. We know that Iran and um, North Korea are in Putin's pocket. Look at these despotic regimes and ask yourself, do you want to live in a world which is, which is governed and ruled by those sort of principles? And you know despots around the globe are watching what happens in Ukraine very, very carefully. And that is why I say Ukraine is the... Ukraine is probably the crucible of peace in our world today. There isn't a more important place. And every other war that's going on is connected in some way. And if we allow, and as brave as they are, and as disciplined, and as, as inventive as they are, if we leave the Ukrainians on their own, they will lose and they will be overrun. And sorry, we talked about saying that Putin wants all of Ukraine. He wants more than that. He wants to extinguish the very Ukrainian national identity. And he will use genocide to do this. And you know, there are five tests of genocide on the United Nations um, on the United Nations Convention. And for genocide to be carried out, only one of those has to be has to be satisfied. And if you listen to Professor Timothy Snyder out of Yale, you know, it is very, very clear that all five tests are being satisfied by Russia in Ukraine today. The one test, the one test on which Putin and a number of his inner circle have been, have been, um, um, have had arrest warrants issued last year was for test number five. Test number five is forcibly removing children of the group and placing them with another group. The authorities have identified at least 20,000 children who have, been, who have been kidnapped. Many have parents and taken away and put with families in Russia. And we've heard stories from children who got back about how they are sent to camps. It is, it is horrendous. Russia... You know, we being very cautious, say 20,000, Russia boasts of 700,000. 
Ukrainian children have been removed in such a way. This is just one way of extinguishing Ukrainian national identity because there is no greater threat to Putin and his kleptocratic regime than a successful free democratic Ukraine on their doorstep. He's not worried about NATO because he ranted and he raved about the fact that Finland and Sweden must not be allowed to join NATO. And last year, Finland joined NATO. And Russia, you know, has a 1,340 kilometer border with Russia. And the first thing Russia did on Finland's accession to NATO was it withdrew its troops from its border with Finland. We can be pretty sure that had Ukraine been admitted into NATO in 2008, Russia would not have attacked. But let me remind, let me remind of one more issue, the Budapest Memorandum, which far too few people know, know about. In 1994, Ukraine gave up what was at the time the third largest nuclear arsenal on Earth. And it gave those nukes up in return for a guarantee of its territorial integrity signed by the UK, the United States, and Russia. Now, while Russia clearly spat on that historic document in 2014 with the illegal annexation of Crimea and the de facto invasion of Donbass, we sat on our hands. The UK at the time sat on their hands and the US at the time sat on their hands. And this was a red rag to a bull. I, I've said earlier on, my real education in what I call the Eastern neighborhood in Ukraine began in 2014, when as a um, senior local government officer and civil servant, I, was, I began getting invited out to former communist countries to work with other civil servants and business leaders on government communications and how to because you know, good government communications is obviously part of a functioning democracy. And that's when the conversations I started having with people, that's when my education really started in those areas. But, you know, we, um, the, the one thing, but before that, before I ever got educated on the area, I heard you can only deal with Russia from a position of strength. Every time a former diplomat or any was interviewed on an issue going back to the 90s, we heard this, you can only deal with Russia from a point of strength. And if I ever had any doubt, my Ukrainian friends and the, the Ukrainians I worked with told me this and told me the truth of this. And why have, so why do we ignore this very, very obvious and simple fact because what we are continuously doing since 2014, and we're still doing it with our incrementalism and not allowing Ukraine full use of weapons and not providing Ukraine with Taurus because clearly Chancellor Schultz believes that that will be a step too far. Every time we have crossed one of Russia's red lines, what have they done? They've done very little. They certainly haven't escalated to um, nuclear level, but we are afraid that they will. And we ignore as well the genocidal utterances of Russian propagandists. And when we do pay attention, we ignore the fact of their genocidal actions on the ground, putting those words uh, into action. Um, there's two more areas to really to focus on uh, in the time we've got left. One is this, the neo-Stalinist playground or experimental area that Donbass has become, where Russia uh, is, is implementing a kind of structured society, a kind of chaos, uh, orchestrated sort of chaos and misery that could easily be compared to the Stalinist era of the 1930s. It could be easily compared to what Hitler wrought in the territories under his control. And yet it, it barely gets a focus. If we don't want Russia to turn big chunks of Western Europe, as well as Ukraine, into those kind of same torture fields, killing fields, what needs to change? 
we need to go all in behind Ukraine, quite simply. And we need to stop with the incrementalism and we need to stop being cowed by Putin's constant threats. We, st we need to stop treating this situation as a chess game and the Ukrainian people as pawns. We need to see the Ukrainian people as we need to see them as people just like us and we need to we need to empathize more with them. We need to imagine what it would be like in our countries. And we then need to realize that actually the world is watching and every despot in the globe is watching very carefully what happens in Ukraine. Will the West have what it takes to actually enable Ukraine to defeat Russia? Because if we don't, and even if there is a even if there is a partial settlement and Ukraine is forced to cede land to Russia, we know that Russia has never kept its word on any agreement it has made with Ukraine since 1991 and before that indeed. We know that Russia will simply use this as a pause. We know Viktor Orban visited Ukraine, was it two days ago, to ask Zelensky for a... Um, you know, to come with terms to talk about a ceasefire. I think we can be pretty certain that Viktor Orban is is um, Putin's lackey, and that he went to um, he went to Kiev at the behest of Putin. And you know, I like I like quoting certain people. There's a there's a very good friend of mine who's a again a senior Ukrainian diplomat, ambassador in one of Europe's great cities. And in the first weeks of this war, he was doing a different job at the time. And he said to me, he was actually, the job he was doing was he was coordinating Ukraine's um, 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 negotiations on sanctions. And he did that for seven months before he was sent to Berlin. And he said to me, Cormac, it's very simple. We were having a conversation like this. He was in Brussels and I was in London. And he said, if Russia stops fighting, there's no war. If Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no Ukraine. And it comes back to what I said, we need to see Russia through Ukrainian eyes. For far too long, we have, we have disrespected Ukraine and the Baltics and the Poles and the other nations in that area. We have looked down on them. They're somehow lesser than us. We, we could teach them how to teach them how to do things. When it comes to dealing with Russia, they have lessons to teach us. And we need we need more humility in our leaders. We need more humility in our people. And we need to realize what these people sacrifice every day. And we need to stop denying them agency and treating them like pawns on a chessboard. It is not for us to say that there should be a buffer zone or Ukraine. It's not for us to say how Ukraine should order their own security arrangements or economic arrangements. Ukraine is not a threat to anyone. Ukraine has no, has no colonial ambitions. Putin knows this. So, you know, we need to give Ukrainians more respect. Well, the last question, and this is going to be a quick one before we uh, before we wrap up. You mentioned something fascinating there about Orban, and I think this is probably going to queue up the next conversation because it's a it's a bigger one that we'll have time for. Um, clearly, Orban is Putin's poodle, and for a while we've started to look at Putin in almost comical sense as the poodle of Xi Jinping, but actually he's been used as a kind of pit bull by China. In a, he's a threatening tool in China's hands, not not just this weak and and failing autocrat. In a way, you can see the way Putin's used Kadyrov to threaten his own internal elites. China seems to now be using Russia and Putin as a kind of attack dog. It deflects away from China and its misdemeanors. At the same time, they can coercively control Western foreign policy through the influence, I would say, and manipulations that they're now able to exert over Russia, the rabid dog in the Kremlin. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more with you. And, you know, I have 
I have said previously that China will sit back and China will play a long game and that we are seeing signs that China is getting more and more involved and now supplying Russia with lethal aid. Um, I tried a analogy once and I don't know if it works. It's like I think of China as a very wealthy but very corrupt businessman and they want somebody sorted out and Russia is the very nasty thug who they employ to go in and break bones and crack heads and maybe murder a few people. So I agree with you. I agree with you absolutely. And I've said before, I've said before when I talk about what's at stake for all of us, our rules-based international order. And we have what we have and we've taken for granted and we can improve it, sure. Or we can have the, we can have the post-West era of Sergei Lavrov's wet dream as he set out in Munich in 2017. And that would be a that would be a world ultimately governed by despotic states that have the sort of of values towards human rights and freedom as we see in Russia, as we see in China, as we see in Iran, as we see in North Korea. And I would just beseech people to just to just linger on that for a while. Just think about that for a while. And these despots are watching very, very carefully what goes on in Ukraine. Defeat, you know, enable Ukraine to to fundamentally defeat Russia in Ukraine. And everybody stands back because that that demonstrates strength and clarity of purpose from the West. But at the moment, we are not demonstrating sufficient strength or sufficient clarity of purpose we are demonstrating hesitancy and bullies bullies love bullies love hesitancy they love signs of fear and that's what we are that's what we are continuously that's what we are continuously showing but yes you're right china is the real problem in the long run and russia will be the russia is the Russia is the thug who's paid to go in and, and do the dirty work. And well, Russia is very, very good at that. That cues us up potentially for the next conversation. We'll launch from that point. For today, though, Cormac, it's been an absolute thrill talking to you. Uh, the force of your language, the fact that your insights really come from having deep exposure to Ukraine, um, and its culture, both political and, uh, you know, its uh, social culture is incredibly powerful. Thank you for this. I look forward to speaking to you again. Jonathan, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me on the channel.